Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Nina Kaza Show. My word, last minute drama, literally last minute drama at Anfield. It finished 2-1 to the Reds, went a goal down, looked bleak, but the Reds came up with the answers. And um, yeah, there's plenty to talk about. I'm trying to catch my breath. Whilst I do that, let me introduce my guests. Hopefully we have some callers as well, but if not, we'll I'm sure we have plenty to talk about. But anyway, enough of me yab- yabbing on. Um, let me get on and let me introduce my guest. First up, a familiar voice on the Nina Kaza show this season. Um, it's great to have him back. Uh, last time I had him on the show, we lost him on United and both him and I were very deflated. Hopefully he's a bit more perky and upbeat. It's Mr. Justin Wells. Justin, welcome to the show. Oh, yeah, no. At this point, you could say I'm fully inflated. Uh, <laughs> Good. No, that's fantastic. I mean, there's nothing I like more than a goal scored during a reggae time. So, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, Fabio Carvalho, build the statue. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. And joining Justin, and I'm really, really delighted to have um, this excellent gent on as well. Classy dude, um, adding a bit of, you know, glitz and glamour to Nina Kaza show. It's Mr. John Buskell. John, welcome back. Oh, thanks, Nina. Hi, it's good to be on the show. And, you know, here I am in Sweden on a night when a Swede. Yes, I was thinking about you. I'm not going to lie. I was like, ah. I know. I've been having text messages from uh, uh, Newcastle supporting fans here in Sweden today. And oh, God. Well, I'm looking forward to talking about it. And thankfully, we got the result because, you know, I was just dreading those that barrack barrage of text yeah I, I can imagine i can imagine and we do have a caller lined up but before i get to him i mean i just want to get your thoughts after that game um j- just for me like uh, like you said it was an origi goal you know like it was just a goal scored in origi time but like i've not felt that kind of tension or drama in quite some time i'm not gonna lie um i feel kind of alive this season the, you know, the 9 0 against Bournemouth was nice and it was a bit of a thumping, but like this, you know, like this, like, you know, it's a decent side. Uh, Liverpool Ray needed a win. Um, it's great to have two back to back wins, but it was just a last minute drama. And, you know, um, for me, I just felt very like, yes, you know, like really felt it. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. I mean, it's exhilarating to win in that kind of fashion. Um, mm. We needed it. We needed it desperately because, first off, Dropping points here, you know, it's not ideal. You don't want to bury yourself this far back of Arsenal and City if you actually intend to intend on contending for the title, right? So you needed the three points just to keep serve. And you know what else? We need another three points against Everton on uh, on Saturday morning. But you you have to play the ninety minutes that you face, right? And you can't quit playing until they're done. And then you eventually, you know, if you score the goal against that, it's like that's the entire thing about what the mentality monster is built, you know, the mentality monster thing is built off of, which is they don't know when they're beat. And at times this season, we've looked like we know when we're, when we're beat, but it's, it's really nice to see a, uh, a young, young, hungry player come in and uh, get a little bit of an injection of hunger and quality to, uh, you know, get a win. Absolutely. And before I come to John, let me just read a few um, messages um, live on Discord. Um, Asho for put in a tweet from um, James uh, Knowlton at JD Knowlton. 
can't remember seeing a team booed off so loud so loudly as Newcastle were at Anfield then. All that time wasting made them pretty unpopular and it came back to bite them. We also have a message here from um NFI. Um in I was gonna say NFL, but luckily I zoomed in and it's NFI and um changed the course of our season there. Um obviously talking about the result. Um John, I will come to you. How do you feel after that? I feel fantastic. It was, do you know, I, I, I know we talk about, you know, season defining moments, blah, blah, blah. But if you, th- I, I think take it, coming away from that, I'm already caught up in the fight. Do you know what I mean? We've had the, we've had the, the boring draw. We've had the really nasty setback. We've had the, we are imperious champions destroying, you know, Bournemouth out of the water. And now we've got that, you know, the classic mentality monsters, cliche, blah, blah, blah. But to see how much was on the line, I don't know if you guys saw it on your coverage, but you know, Klopp was pumping the fist at, at, at the, the cop. And already he's doing that. What is it? Four, four games into the season, as it, I, you know, I can't even remember. It just takes my breath away that we've we've got the energy, the passion, the fight, the determination to win. Already, the 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 club is really sparking to life. So I mean, I'm just yeah, bouncing off the walls. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just like, reading just so many comments and I'll get through to them. But we do have a call and I, obviously it is quite late and um, I don't want to keep him waiting. It's a familiar voice on the Nina Kalza show. Normally the first call on the Nina Kalza show as well. So he's holding his, uh, his uh, starting lineup there. It is Kieran. Kieran Reid. Thank you very much for having me on. And Nana is so good. And you know what? You've become such a staple on the Nina Kaza show that, um, you know, I don't even like stumble on your name or anything. So that's always a good thing. <laughs> 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 the floor's yours. So um, take it away. Um, it was a very scrappy game of football. I thought it was going to be one of those frustrating nights. But then I thought, but the, but the score last minute, one of the guys is just a fantastic feeling. And uh, I'm just relieved that we got the three points because. You know, like I, like I said before, it was we didn't play particularly well. I thought uh, it was a scrappy game. And like you said before, it was a game where we had to work hard and we did that and we got the three points. And um, that's the main thing. So, um, no, sorry if I'm a bit out of turn because I'm uh, a bit tipsy because I've had a few drinks on me. So I don't mean to sound a bit out of turn. So. No, 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 you sound absolutely fine. I'm sure many people are probably in, in the same position as you there, um, uh, Kieran. Yeah, I mean, you, you touched on something there that, you know, um, uh, you know, scrappy win, um, really, really important considering, you know, we have um, the match of the Merseyside derby of the weekend. You know, they're mm-hmm. in the best of shape. You kind of want to go in there, you know. Oh, you, yeah, definitely. You, know, you want to go in there full on, you know, full of yeah. confidence. And I think somebody mm-hmm. mentioned in the chat as well, Nunez will be back as well. And, you know, it just adds more and more confidence. The bench is looking yeah. stronger. Yeah, it'll be uh, yeah, it'll be uh, an intriguing game, the Derby on Saturday. But you know, but the main thing is, you just hope we can get the three points. I think it'll be similar day tonight. It'll be scrappy, but I think the main thing is, just hope we get the three points. You couldn't care less, Roy. Really. So that's the main thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Kieran, thank you so much for that, and enjoy the rest My pleasure, of the evening. Thank you. No, no, it's been, it's, it's a pleasure. Right, guys, um, so that was Kieran kicking things off on the Nina Kaza show. I do have a question as well, which I will get to in a minute. Yeah, apologies if you heard any background noise there, people who are joining us live. Um, Kieran um, forgot to mute himself. <laughs> Luckily, I stepped in and sorted that out. Enjoy the rest of your evening, Kieran. Right, let's move on. Um, John, I'm going to come to you because we always start off from the beginning and uh, let's, let's kick this off. I mean, for me, um, the team lineup unchanged. I'm not surprised given the fact that they won 9 0. No one really deserved to lose their place given the fact that everyone looked pretty, de- pretty decent against Bournemouth. I wasn't surprised about that. Things that I really did like was seeing some, um, senior players back on the bench, you know, kind of bolstering that up, giving Klopp a bit more options. Um, what did you make of the starting lineup? I, I'm assuming you expected it to be how it was. Yep, absolutely. Sorry, just unmuting myself there. Yeah, the only thing that I was possibly expecting was maybe to switch out Hendo for Milner and then swap them over later in the match. Mm. Um, because I, I, I've not been, you know, Hen- I've, I've always been a huge Jordan Henderson fan. I've felt that he's not quite at it at the moment. And and I did wonder if he'd get more space later in the game. Milner's very good for sort of, you know, 
shutting things down, really closing out games. And I thought Newcastle would really come at us this evening because they've been looking like an informed side. Uh, and I just wondered if Henderson would find more space later on in the game. But uh, that was the only thing that I was really looking for to see any different. But I was pleased to see Jones in particular on the bench because I was beginning to get worried about mystery injuries to Curtis Jones. So that was good. But otherwise, the, the, the lineup was pretty much what I expected. No, um, uh, wonderful stuff. I like the fact that you kind of thought maybe interchange them too in, in terms of midfield, um, uh, you know. Um, yeah, um, uh, Justin, same question to you. Um, uh, team lineup and the bench. Yeah, the team lineup, I thought basically John nailed. The only thing I could have also saw, which I think, which was figured out to be later, was uh, for obviously explainable reasons, was that I thought that Carvalho might come in for um, Elliot, but... Mm. Turns out that the reason Elliot missed training was most likely to the funeral of his grandmother, and uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, our condolences to the Elliot family. But um, the uh, that's basic. I think John basically has it right. I mean, at this at this point in time, you really do have to manage the minutes of a thirty two and a thirty six year old who have played a lot in uh, you know not in and the games are starting to come a lot more frequently. You really need to manage their minutes, otherwise. We're going to be adding some names to the trainers to the training table, and um, I, I don't know if anything did happen to Jordan Henderson. But once he came off the pitch, uh, he did run down the tunnel. So I guess that's something that's worth checking on: is whether or not Henderson went down the tunnel because he was injured or for some other reason. I did see him at the end when Cavalier scored, and obviously everyone got into a bit, you know, got a bit scrappy on the touchline. I did see him kind of like, you know, giving, you know. Um, Asserting his uh, prep. yeah, but that's because he's a Sunderland yeah. boy who wants yeah. to fight. Them. <laughs> yeah, I want to stick it to them. He's a Macam who wants to fight some Mac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Justin, I'll stick with you because um, the one thing that kind of really um, impressed me about um, the the Bournemouth game was uh, the 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 quick start, and I felt like Liverpool tried to do that at the beginning. I mean, what did you make of it? I felt like. It's a really interesting one, right? Because I'm not really going to talk play by play or minute by minute. But for me, it kind of started off really, uh, Liverpool started off with some kind of intensity that, you know, they were playing fast football. And then Newcastle kind of settled into the game, kind of took the sting out of us a little bit. We started sort of dumbing down the pace, you know, um, and then, and then, you know, like, that's how it kind of peaked out for me. And that's what I kind of saw, like, when... Newcastle kind of started like finding their feet in the game like we started looking less less like ourselves which is never a good thing and Liverpool should never ever dumb down their quality um they shouldn't but um I think that Liverpool basically combined the worst parts of the first half against United and the worst parts of the first half against Palace there was intense energy to try to get forward, which was missing from United. There was prolonged possession, which was missing from United. And then there was, but there was all the bluntness and uh, yes, aimlessness again that we that we showed against. Uh, I mean, the first half of football was some some uh, to, to to put it rather blunt, some real ugly shit. Um, we uh, just we we didn't create much. We, we fell into some very slow and ponderous patterns of play. And we got hit with a sucker punch that was a mental lapse from multiple players. But Jordan Henderson was right in the middle of it as well. So obviously that's going to draw people's attention. But it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be the only thing that draws people, it's people's attention from either that goal or that. Because we were pretty poor and we were pretty poor all around, but maybe the exception of Harvey Elliott. I, I would have to agree with that. And I thought Diaz looked quite sparky as well. Um, uh, I definitely think that he's probably like showing some intensity as well. Like I felt like there was like willingness from him. I will talk about um, the, the goal that they scored. And, uh, you know, let's not just focus on Jordan Henderson in, in, in the build-up to that goal. I mean, John, what did you make of the first half? Because obviously it's significantly improved in the second half with some of the subs. We'll get to that in a minute. But I felt like... When Liverpool were a little bit more direct, they were probably a little bit better. The only thing that I found really, really frustrating, and I think um, Justin hit the nail on the head, was the fact that we looked really blunt. I felt like, you know, that defence, again, it wasn't um, Eddie Howe's first choice defence. He kind of played, you know, Lachelle's 
and uh, Burns, I believe. Um, about pairing, which is usually what he doesn't go for, you know, and um, normally it's Botman and, and Cher. Um, and I felt like, you know, we could have had a lot of joy in, in getting in behind that defence, but unfortunately there was probably no target man to do that because our, you know, our Salahs and Diaz's were out wide, you know, trying to, you know, run in and cut in. And I felt like that's where, you know, we could have really caused them a lot of problems. I was I was making notes, and the thing I kept writing down was how poor our passing was. I sort of had a mind map and was trying to sort of zoom in on things. And you know, I I, I was counting. You know, Henderson was missing his passes. Trent misplaced a pass that led to a goal. Virgil Van Dijk was sloppy with his passing. Robbo was sloppy with his passing. So although we we had a lot of speed, we were Diaz in Diaz and Harvey Elliott were really fantastic moving, you know, from the flanks trying to move uh, into the center to sort of play off balls to 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 Bobby or to to Mo. And that's why I felt that the real energy and if we were going to get a breakthrough, that's that was where it was going to come from. Not necessarily a moment of of individual brilliance like we saw the other day, uh, but but more sort of, you know, um uh, Diaz or or Elliot feeding through the ball, but I was just you know really really frustrated at the quality of our passing. We missed so many. So when 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 you talked about you know not creating chances, I just felt we weren't doing the basics. We get we had the ball, we were moving very quickly, then we'd pass it around, and and of course the goal comes from us losing losing possession. I don't know what it. it I think it was the same against United too. I just don't think... No, let me rephrase that. I think some players like Trent, like Virgil, who've traditionally been really good passers of the ball, seem to be taking that extra touch, taking that moment of ponderous to to think, to look around them, that slows down the play, and then those passes don't come come off. So that that would be my, you know, Mr. Jurgen Klopp. Your homework is please get the side passing better because I think it's pretty dreadful at the moment. I think that's all really tactical, and I say tactical. I mean, like they don't know what they're supposed to be doing because the tactics we're employing are confusing and don't fit the personnel we have. They really don't. If you, they, we get, we're trying to spread the pitch so much to create service to our center forward. Who would this works if it's Darwin Nunez and you can force other teams backwards, but it doesn't work when Roberto Fernando playing as a number nine. So basically, what we do is we pat, we're making long passes into very congested areas, and when you do that, you don't break team presence. You, you're passing into their play, and that seems to be the problem tactically that we're having at the moment. Because it's not just down to, you know, this player's crap or this other team has, you know, this particular tactic that works for them. It's really down to the fact that we're instituting new tactics that absolutely don't put any of the players that we have at the moment, or at least many of them, in the right situations for, for what we're doing. Um, the task maps are terrible, and today looked like we broke down a lot of attacks in the same spot that we've been breaking down uh, at least in the first half recently, which is the ball ends up in the half space with Henderson on one side or Robertson on the other. And both of them just end up not knowing what to do with it because they're both passing this ball, the ball from places that they're not used to being and into, you know, areas that they probably shouldn't be passing into. Really, really interesting, and um, I do now think that why would you change? You know, ta- why would you tactically ask for things that first of all they're not comfortable with, and which is you know is you know if if players said players have um a limited skill set and they can't do it, and uh, some of them are quite old as well, so it's not like you know I, <laughs> I, I'm not being ages, but it is quite hard to do that with you know certainly our older players like like you mentioned Jordan Henderson there as well, um. I also felt like, you know, um, Newcastle were quite, um, I don't know, like what I kind of noticed was they were trying to smother um, our right-hand side a fair bit as well. Um, you know, I felt like, um, you know, Mo Salah wasn't getting an awful lot of joy on, on the right-hand side. Um, it was quite compact. I thought um, uh, I thought Diaz was doing really well against Trippier. I'm going to put that out there. 
I thought he handled that battle really, really well. Um, I do have a question, and I'm going to come to John first on this one. Um, it's from You Never Walk Alone Foodie, and his question to the panel is, um, do you think um, uh, we should start Cavalio? Um, also, would you drop um, Robo for Shimikas? I well the the Robo Shimikas question that's an interesting one. I think Robo is much better defensively. I think Shimikas is a better crosser of the ball. Um, I think Robo uh, is better in transitions. He's better in pressing. Uh, he's m- much more aggressive. I don't think his corners are as good as Shimikas is. Um, but that's not to, but I think, I think at the moment, uh, you know, sort of 60, 40 Robbo playing 60, I, I do think he's one of the players that seems to be suffering more from fatigue from last season. Uh, and so I do think, I do think there is a drop off with Samikas, but I don't think it's, uh, I think bringing him on later in the game, you know, with say 20, 15 minutes to go is on field. Yeah, with tired players on the pitch. Yeah, and, exactly. Know, yeah, he can like run things. No, I, I think that's wise. And um, uh, and what about the the Cavalio shout? Because um, one thing I did notice was obviously we'll, we'll get to the second half in a minute, and uh, obviously we're going to talk about um the the goal that we conceded first. There's, we're a bit everywhere on this show, but you know one thing I did kind of notice was the amount of energy in that midfield and uh, just how um. I don't know, there was just a lot of joy on the left-hand side with, you know, the likes of Cavalio there, Diaz there, and, you know, Shimikas there as well. Um, I just felt like, you know, like you've said, like, you know, it was very slow, it was very lethargic. Um, but when you have these young players, one thing I did notice was they were moving the ball quicker. They were passing the ball quicker and moving quicker. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's fan- he. I, he is fantastic. I think both he and Elliot, you know, I, I just came away from that, that game thinking, I remember seeing uh, when Steve McManaman, when uh, uh, Robbie Fowler came into the mm-hmm. side, these young guys, Michael Owen coming to these really young players who were suddenly, you know, walking the walk with the established pros. And suddenly there were these exciting players and, you know, I think the reason that, to to answer the question, no, I wouldn't be starting Cavalio. I think, right, I think Klopp was, did it perfectly correctly this evening. I think to start Cavalio and Elliot, it's like saying, I'm putting all my eggs in the basket of you young guys. You young guys are so fantastic. Now go out and deliver the result. Whereas Elliot's played more in the premiership. He's more integrated into the side, even though he missed a lot of last season. I think the way that Klopp can sell this to these younger players is to say, you know, you will get your chances. Cavalio has got, he has got such a good attitude. What is it he said when he signed? I want to be, you know, uh, uh, player of the year or, you know, whatever. He's picking up all the awards. That guy is a hungry, aggressive footballer. He might be slim and, and, and you know, writhe, but he is, he is a powerful fighter. He's going to be a phenomenal player for us. But I think the way that Klopp is handling him strategically, him and Elliot at this moment is, is looking really, really sensible and really effective. Maybe that extra yard of space he has through his youth it comes, you know, coming on later into the match. He was a game changer. Fantastic energy. I loved watching him and Elliot. They're further on than I thought they would be. But uh, again, to answer the question, no, I, I wouldn't be starting him just yet, but I'm sure Klopp will be doing that. Nice. And same question to you, Justin. I mean, do, do you think, um, you know, as as mouthwatering as a prospect that is, I mean, do, do you think, um, obviously, with, with where the midfield is right now in terms of obviously the uh, injury to Thiago, we don't know what's happened with Naby Keita. I mean, does this like, um, I don't know if you have like two young eights, I mean, does that make it harder for Fabio, do you reckon, um, uh, Fabinho, do you reckon, you know, with, with regards to, you know, I don't know, maybe Jordan Henson does offer him some kind of, I don't know, senior experience, you know, some kind of discipline in that midfield. And maybe um, you, you'll you have um, uh, Fabinho doing a lot of like defensive and screening work if them two are like full on attack. Although I, I was impressed with um, 
um, Cavaliers and, you know, like sort of defensive work as well. But, I mean, I'd like to get your thoughts on that and also Chimikas for Robbo. I mean, the way we play, we need a lot of midfielders. Mm-hmm. We rotate all of them except for Fabinho. So do I think that Harvey and Fabio are going to play, if, you know, regardless of who's available? Yes. I'm sorry, I just answered that basically verbatim to Virgil Van Dyke's press conference, their newspaper article the other day. Um, no, but I think he has to play, right? Like, that's uh, what like that's, that's what we need out of him. He, he needs to take on minutes. We don't know other players at the moment. So at some point, he's going to have to start a game. The only question is going to be, where do you start him? Because are you playing him at the left side at eight? Are you playing him on one of the wings? Are you playing him up up the uh, uh, as a center forward? Like, I don't. We don't know what his best position is yet. We don't know where he functions from the start yet, and where he, where his understanding is of roles within the system, right? So, I'm sure you're going to see him start a game, and stick the place out at some point too, because he's young and he's going to do that. Yeah. Right. Because you know, even great players do that. Yep. But uh, he's going to have to play. He's going to have to start at some point. It looks like the place where he can get minutes right now is at the left side of eight. So. Um, that's that's where he's gonna play because right now our your best your best two options if you don't want to play uh, George Henderson there are Curtis Jones and Fabio Cavallo. So it's gonna be someone young. It is gonna be somebody young, and uh, you know, two two sub appearances and two goals. Um. Uh, for him back to back, which is wonderful stuff, and obviously that'll do his confidence a world of good. I mean, I don't know if I should just stick to the questions. I might as well. I've got another one here, and Justin, I'll I'll come to you first on this one. This is from Chris Singh, and he's got a question for the panel. Should this be the last start for Hendo for the next few games? It's no, it's no coincidence. We we get better when he comes off. So, I mean, do you want to talk about Jordan Henderson's performance? I know you were talking about it pre-pod. Yeah, sure. Fine. Um, now's, the, now's the time in the podcast where we talk about Henderson. Okay. Um, yeah, he looks, he, he, he looks like he's not particularly good at playing football at the moment. Um, his legs are not great. He, he, like, he, he, if you play him in either of the eight roles at the moment, what happens is you ask him to get both pretty high up the pitch because we get our eight pretty high up the pitch in the press. And if they fail the press, which happens because, you know, Premier League players can play around presses pretty easily, um, you have to get back. And he doesn't have the legs to do both of those things. So it means his only real role is then in the six. But if you're going to play him in the six, what you need are two eights who are really active, again, so that you have a blanket to press and you're just charging him with, Ball recovery and ball circulation. So, at the moment, should he play? Probably not, because we don't have the things around him to make him look good. And he can't make us look better with the things that he's currently doing. But do we really have another choice, considering where the squad is? Uh, the answer is no, until we can get someone healthy or some more healthy players in. And it's just up to Klopp to figure out how to hide his deficiencies and figure out what he can do well, which is he's a reasonably good passer and he's reasonably good at, you know, progressing the ball at the pitch. But the other things that he's offering right now, like the, the not really tracking runners, the situational lapses, uh, just the amount of energy he's playing with, like those aren't things that I would particularly want to start a game with right now, but you don't really have another option. So, you know, buy a player or, uh, you're doing this. It's not looking good. And, you know, I think Klopp's comments and so late in the transfer window as well, it doesn't look good. Um, we can only hope that, you know, players do get healthy. I've pretty much, I've pretty much now um, uh, all all hopes and aspirations of getting the right midfielder have pretty much died for me. So, John, same question to you. And and I know, like, you and I speak a lot and we speak a lot on, on this show as well. And, you know, you... You, you, you've always been a realist and that, that's one thing I do like about a lot of people that come on this show um, uh, the, the guests that you know you, you talk about it game by game you know it's and that's how it should be what, what they kind of offered in this game and obviously we're not going to get into the goal just yet but what did you make of it, Jordan Henderson's p- performance today and um, uh, would you agree with Chris's um, comments there because I don't think he's been great if I'm absolutely honest since he's signed his contract extension 
No, I don't think he's been great. I I did wonder at the time. I think okay, that's another topic. Was the length of his contract extension, you know, was it too long? I think it was too long for a player with his injury record. He's a legend. He's a fantastic player. I don't want to take anything, you know, I, I'm not a Hendon Basher, Hendo Basher, but I, I, I think I have a couple of observations from this evening. And I think one of them is he's not on the pitch when Cavalio does his best work. And I think that's interesting because I think if Cavalio starts with Henderson. Henderson is one of the players meant to protect Cavalio and uh Trent. It's like, you know, the 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 patrolling of of of, of the of the midfield. Uh so it didn't surprise me that he's taken off before we start to see, you know, more of the youngsters coming on. Um so that was one cuz so I I I don't think he's got the fitness for that. I think Klopp is using Milner and Henderson as one player. One plays for a certain amount of time, then they get switched off. Except I don't think Henderson can really cover the six. He's not got the physicality for the six. And he's struggling with the passing for the for the eight. Spurs <sighs> against Manchester United in that, and that's his, probably his best position. Yeah, but, but I, w- I will say one thing in Henderson's defence, and that is this. There is a point in the first half when uh, Newcastle attack, the ball goes to Virgil van Dijk, and uh, Van Dyke plays the ball, and the Newcastle player, I can't remember who it is, it's on, on the left-hand side of the, the pitch, we're attacking the cop. The, the cop. Va- Van Dyke plays the ball, and it bounces ungainly, and sort of knocks the Newcastle player and, and goes out. And it's a bit clumsy on, on Van Dyke's part. And this is what it, it says to me about Henderson, is that... It would have been, it was fractions away from the Newcastle player. The bou- if the bounce goes the way of the Newcastle player, he is past Virgil van Dijk. He's gone and there's no way that van Dijk is catching him up because va- van Dijk has moved across. And these are fine margins. When Jordan Henderson plays a, a, a ball into the, into the box, that Mo Salah runs on. If if Salah goes on and scores, then it's a great pass, a great assist from Henderson. So there are such fine margins because I do think if if the Newcastle player gets past Van Dijk and he's you know the last defender because Gomez is miles away on the other side of the pitch, then it's Virgil Van Dijk who we're having this conversation about. We're saying, oh, Van Dijk's been very sloppy. He's not running as much as he was. Is our injuries beginning to catch up with? Him? So, I mean, I, I think Hendo is partly unlucky. I think he's also struggling physically. And I, th- I think, you know, this is this whole thing about squad size and the team. I, I truly believe that the transition of Jordan Henderson from first team starter to old man of the squad coming in and doing the role that Milner has done, maybe... We're in a transition this season, and part of that will be the transition of Hendo. And he does great things at times, and he will make mistakes at times. But I also think that with Virgil van Dijk and other members, aging members of the squad, there are going to be more of those moments during the season when our older players don't have the speed, that things don't work out for them, whereas they have done in the past. So it's it's not, I don't want to rain entirely on Henderson's parade. I'm trying. I'm trying to bring some balance to this, Nina. So I think the I think you've all hit the nail on the head. I think the one thing that kind of just on a side note, which probably isn't football related, or maybe it is. I don't know. You, you guys decide. I think the one thing that kind of really frustrated me was um, when he was coming off, and it was one all, and he was just farting around trying to pass on the captaincy armband, and then he runs up to Virgil Van Dijk and puts it on his um, sleeve and stuff, and I'm just like, you know what, just. Hand it to the closest red shirt. Next what was that all just, about? Just leg it off. You don't need to physically. Yeah. Run. Like I'm, I know it's a side note, but like things like that really piss me off. Like I've never ever seen a team so precious about the armband. It like, was whole just, weird. It, did I'm so glad I'm not the only one that. No, was no, no, it was super weird because I was thinking, why is he not giving it to Milner? Why is he making a big deal about it? Why is he wasting time when we're? Yes. Moaning about Newcastle. Yes. Uh, I think he was psychologically egging Newcastle on, and the referee as well. That's why he added all eight minutes. It's actually elite mentality. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
wondered if he's he got a move on. I mean, do you want to elaborate on that? Because like, I don't even see it from that. Oh, from I'm, that I'm, 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 I'm joking. He should have run right off the pitch. But, you know, I mean, that like went over my head. Just, yeah, that like went he was over. encouraging Newcastle to waste more time. And then Andre Mariner, the first time I've actually seen a referee add wasted time back onto the, onto the clock. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give him credit for that um, because I thought he actually had an awful game as well, the referee, but we won't even get into that. I mean, Justin, I'm going to come to you because, you know, one thing I kind of notice is when Liverpool are a little bit toothless and a bit wasteful, I think they had a few direct chances. And when they did, I thought Newcastle looked a little shaky. You know, we saw little good movements from Salah just in, in little, little flashes. But at 37 minutes, I mean, we get a little bit sucker punched. And it it's that familiarity of uh, conceding um conceding first and uh, Isaac's goal and um, there were so many errors and I want you to kind of talk about this because obviously you've got the the, the dodgy pass from Trent Alexander-Arnold and then you've got you know um, Hendo kind of fit, um, you know like you know didn't do a good job of clearing it um, you know then you've got Longstaff who plays it into Isaac and you know, whilst he does that, um, you know, Fabinho comes out and there's nobody behind Fabinho and Gomez doesn't even know what he's doing or where he is. It's just a collection of like errors. And I feel like there's probably a lot that you, there's a lot of players maybe you can point fingers at. I felt like as a collective, that wasn't Liverpool best switched on. And when we concede goals, they're of our own make, making, it seems. Yeah, this one was at least... Uh you know, heartwarming and brought me back to the days of the Brendan Rodgers era because of just how <laughs> oh, bad no. a, just how bad a team goal it was to allow. Trent's pass is a horrific turnover. The next ball is played into a spot where Robertson steps completely out of position. Virgil shuffles over to cover him, leaving a giant gap to Isaac. At this point, Henderson sort of intercepts the ball but then stabs it right to Longstaff. Bad is too slow to get out to Longstaff, even though the ball doesn't move to him particularly quickly. Henderson just watches Isaac run into vacated space, and Gomez has no idea where the striker is. So you've got a bunch of people making a mistake on that goal. Um, the reason that Jordan Henderson's going to get, you know, the Pelter score is because uh, instead of making his mistake is the most visible because he lets Isaac run into that space. But there's a lot of people creating that space space for Alexander Isaac to run into and yeah that was a that's that's a pretty bad goal great finish though um he's a really nice player and I'll, I'll turn it over to John to talk about Alexander Isaac yeah um uh, I, I definitely think so as well I mean um he took that really really well and um I think he's going to do really really well for Newcastle and um you know because initially I did think, oh, Gomez is doing really well with him, you know, like, and then, like, he just needs a moment, doesn't he? I mean, what, I mean, what did you make of the goal and, um, you know, the, the, the finish, if, if I can go there to you, John, because, you know, he, he, you know he's, he's a fellow countryman. Um, I mean, like, like I said, the, the, the comparison I made between Van Dyke and, and Henderson in, in the last point we were talking about, I think Henderson is very, unla- he's, you know, partly unlucky. I also think that, uh, Fabinho is, um, slightly out of position and struggles to pick up the ball. Um, Isak is just, he, he, sl- he kind of, you know, slinks into the space there, uh, and Gomez, was not tracking him. They, they seem to be, you know, all looking on the other side of the pitch. And in comes Isak, like, you know, just... I, I, he's, an interest, he's an interesting player because I did wonder if he had the physical strength for the Premier League. Mm. I mean, he's obviously, you know, he's tall, he's very, very fast, he's a great finisher. Um, and, he, you know, when he gets pulled, I think he, apart from the goal and some good running, he doesn't really do that much to threaten. But it's a fantastic goal. And I think we gave him the opportunity. I don't think Hendo is the main culprit. He's one of the culprits at the scene of the crime. I think Trent for giving away the pass, you know, sloppy in the first base. I think Fabinho's positional play isn't great. And Gomez has left too much space. And Ingo Zizek, it's a great finish. Um... Could Allison have done any more? I don't think so. He had no chance. Yeah. 
it's a free it's a free striker shooting from the penalty for basically the penalty. It's, it's the romance of football. Look, you come to a big club, you're the new guy. I'm from Sweden on the podcast. Of course, the Swedish guy is going to score, you know. I was thinking when he, when, when, when he got his second and it, thankfully he was offside, I was like, oh God, I can't deal with this. Not that you would be unbearable, obviously not. I was like, this is just like bad no, I couldn't luck. take it. Yeah. Couldn't he take just, it, couldn't yeah. take it. Couldn't take it. No, he was, I mean, he sucks really good. And I think, I mean, I think the point that we're all sort of touching out on here is that in the first half, you know, we had, we had that initial fizz of determination, but it was very, very apparent that the Bournemouth game wasn't carrying on. And, you know, like, like, like you said, Justin, with your, you know, joke comment about uh, Henderson fronting up to them with the time, we, they were playing the dark arts. We were not. We were being the nice guys leaving space for their new striker to run in and, and put us under a lot of pressure. And I think in that first half, it asked a lot of questions of Liverpool's squad. How are we going to deal with these sides increasingly coming to Anfield and being very physical, wasting time? I mean, how many times did the, how many minutes did the keeper spend on the floor? And you can bet that Jordan Pickford will be beating that at the weekend. Oh, yeah. The, the ball's going to be in play for like 25 minutes against everyone. Yeah. It, but, it's it's going to be a disgusting game of football to watch. But if what are Allison, we doing about it? If Alisson can recreate his time wasting, to, uh, grabbing the ball and just lying on it, I will really, really, very much appreciate that. Yeah. You know, um, uh, did, that. Did you guys happen to catch Fabio's celebration for his goal? I didn't know. I was too busy in my own. He immediately went to go lie down on the ground like he was cramping up to time, as a scoop on them time wasting. Oh, I can't wait to watch that on loop tomorrow. You know Legend. what I'm doing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Right, guys, we've got a bit of a burst of callers. Uh, the pod father wants in on the action. Um, it's quite nice that he's joining us live. So, you know, honoured to have him on. Gags, unmute Hello. yourself. <laughs> Hello. How's everybody doing? Oh, man, I let out a big scream and, uh, when we scored that goal. That was, that was fun. So, oh, man, it's such a hard time to be a fan right now. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it, I think um, the kids deserve it, you know. Elliot deserved all the praise on Saturday. He deserves one today. Carvalho today as well. Amazing. Um, I just wanted to follow on from some of the stuff um, John was saying there. John, hope you're well, my friend. Long time. Hope I'm good. Doing... I'm good. Good man. Um, just the time wasting was, was sickening, you know. And I've just, I've just been watching Eddie Howe's interview. I'm not sure if you guys watched it but he said you know it wasn't um it wasn't time wasting it was legit and all this and then second half we just tried to slow the game down so slowing the game down and time wasting yeah eddie did the same thing mate and i, I don't know if you saw the joel matip shithousery after we scored but he is literally like on the floor in front of the in front of the newcastle bench and i've put a gif of it out on twitter if you do want to go check out but it's absolutely hilarious they deserved it they absolutely deserved it eight last minute of uh, injury time eight minutes and um it's got extended due to their their time wasting and we score just it's just poetry you there, guys? because obviously target really really pissed off Jurgen Klopp in it towards the end of I think 40 minutes on the first half and I just remember Jurgen Klopp going absolutely batshit at, at the fourth official and all my eyes were fixated on was Joe Matip not knowing what day of the week it was and long may that continue because I just think he's he's entertainment without even knowing it my question then to you three of you actually is an interesting one based on Klopp there that's probably the most annoyed we've seen him. In the last two, three weeks, it's probably the most under pressure we've I seen him at Liverpool. Looks I just want to... Yeah, exactly. I want to get your thoughts on, on you know, on on his behaviour at the moment. And it's not bad. I mean, it's just... That's just... Managers are emotional, but, you know, what he's going through and, and should, you know, maybe, probably, he's won everything. He doesn't need to be under pressure. He doesn't need to feel it. He He, he just needs to... Needs to sort it out. I think more than anything, he needs to fucking sort it all out uh, and and not be probably as agitated. I think he, I suppose he's just an emotional human. But I'd like to hear what you guys think. 
it's very, very interesting. And um, I am going to come to Justin first on this one. I mean, Justin, I've kind of been paying attention to his press conferences. And when, you know, like I kind of thought, you know, when, when the quotes came out where he goes, you lot were right and I was wrong, we need a midfielder, kind of took it as a bit of like, I don't know, like a slap down, a bit of sarcasm. Um, I saw his uh, pre um, uh, um, uh, the 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 pre press conference for um, uh, this game, the Newcastle game, and he was kind of talking about look. Um, obviously, he was, he was referring to um, the whole Bournemouth situation, how Scott Parker hasn't got the funds, and he just said, look, you know, I I have to function. There's things that I can already do, and you know, if I'm all, if I'm already allowed this amount of money, and if it's you know, he was kind of talking in a way that was kind of saying that you have to within your means and stuff um I, I have noticed him to be a bit frustrated a bit agitated i don't know if it's the repetitiveness of the same questions from the journalists i don't know if it's the case of him having to deal with um this poor start and you know maybe the microscope being on liverpool for all the wrong reasons um I don't know what it is. Is there something behind the scenes in terms of he actually wants somebody and he's not getting the funds? I don't know. I I don't know anything. But he doesn't seem himself. And I think a lot of it is probably down to the fact, for me personally, is the fact that his team have not been great. I think he... I I think a few things, right? Gags Gags has heard me say this, so it's going to probably annoy him to hear me say it again. But Klopp effectively... He, there's a million different ways to interpret what he said constantly. It's like a kaleidoscope. You're going to think that whatever he says agreed with what he thought before he said it. And the, and the reason that that's worked out for the most part is that Klopp is a damn good politician, right? And that's a lot of what management is. It's managing the expectations of your owners, the expectations of supporters, the expectations of the press, the expectations of the guys in the locker room. And just trying to make sure that you say nothing at any point in time that offends any one of them. But if you're going to offend one of them, you try to offend the one that uh, matters the least to you. In this particular case, that's the press, right? They're they're the ones who, they don't pay a salary. The only thing they do is write what's going to be written about them in newspapers. But most of the things that are going to be written about them in newspapers aren't going to be cared about by Liverpool supporters as long as we win. So... He's going to say whatever he thinks the press wants to hear sometimes because it's the easiest way to just avoid scrutiny. But he's never going to be able to keep everybody happy. And I think that's really what is going on with him right now. And he's finally just, I think he's come, to, I think he's been at, you know, to grips with that for a while. I just also think he hasn't dealt with supporters being a little bit irritated with him in a while. So I think that's really what it is. And it's also the fact that obviously the team and, and why are they why are they irritated with them? Because the team is having some significant malfunctioning that's partly predicated upon choices he's made. So that's just part of the job. It's, he has to take it, and the, he has two ways out of this. Um, there really is one way out of it, which is just improve what's happening on the pitch. If that happens, his frustration goes down, and he can go back to being a media darling. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before I come to John, uh, Nigel just put something in Discord there. It's a quote from Neil. Um, it's it's um a, a Twitter caption. Um, a, 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 well, a, a tweet from a Neil Jones at Neil Jones goal. Flop asked if he expects deadline day transfers. The quote: I don't think so. But as long as there's time, we should not close the door completely. Says Jordan Henderson has a hamstring injury. Um. And over to you, John. Okay, the news about the hamstring injury wasn't good. Um, To go back to the whole Klopp thing that Gags was asking, it's really difficult to sort of, you know, I don't want to psychologise Klopp. I think two things that I noticed, or I noticed the same thing twice, um, just from an observational point, and that was um, the Newcastle, the Liverpool player does something, the Newcastle player acts like they're, they've been poleaxed. There was one particular on our left when we're playing, when we're attacking. Um, and we know when we were attacking the Klopp, a co- <laughs> the Klopp, the Klopp. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, 
the I think it was Burns, the Newcastle player goes down like he's been, you know, hit from behind with a gun. And then the replay shows that the guy's just faked it completely. And Klopp sees this because it's right in front of the bench. And Klopp goes absolutely ballistic at the uh, the the officials on the side there. And I think that's some, you know, kind of like a <laughs> a manifestation of what's been going on. That that there's been so much sledging. Is that the kind of like the cricket term where where the, the Newcastle are doing all the dark arts of you know kicking and feigning injury and time wasting and and it's like there. I, I mean, there's no point talking about the referee, but it's like that Newcastle are getting all the decisions. Everything's going against Klopp, and I think partly his frustration there is that the officials and that. Liverpool, it comes just after Mo has been pulled in the box. There was a moment in early in the first half. I'm surprised there wasn't more of a shout for a penalty when the ball's played into Mo and, uh, he, he looks like he's just getting away from the man and the, 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 the Newcastle guy pulls at his shirt a bit and it's sort of, you know, we're away and we're off. And it's like even the slightest decision that could go Liverpool's way doesn't even get looked at. Whereas Newcastle, got the decisions. And I think partly uh, the way I read Klopp's reactions were almost like, you know, the building up of this decision went against us, this decision went against us. I mean, there is a whole, I think there is also that whole other thing of, and, you know, you can see conspiracies everywhere. Conspiracy is not the right word, but, you know, Henderson looks unhappy when he's get taken off. You know, he's a he's a, a Sunderland boy who wants to be fighting against Newcastle. He's the first guy pulled off. Boy, he's not happy with that. Klopp's not happy. There are things going, but it's very easy to make these kind of to catastrophize. I don't know, but he does look like a man under pressure for some reason, and um, it'll go. It'll it'll move on as long as we get the win the the win the win at the weekend. It's tough times, I think, to be Jurgen Klopp right now because of all the top clubs. You know, City just won six nil. There's no pressure. I mean, I haven't even seen Guardiola mentioned in the press since the start of the season. But everything is the scrutiny is on Klopp. The scrutiny is on the club that has outperformed over the last few years, outperformed their resources, really, really done phenomenally. And I think it's almost like, you know, let's, because he's such a nice, interesting guy, there's, uh, from looking from the outside, you always expect the British media to want to knock that person down. And I do kind of feel like, well, okay, if we could kick anyone, we'll kick Klopp. Camera, cam, the, uh, the director liked focusing on Klopp going ballistic all the time. Yeah, they do. I, th- I think they kind of see it as fake niceness from him. I don't think they probably see it as genuine. Um, uh, it's very interesting, but yeah. Um, and and I thought that the target one was where he went absolutely ballistic when he faked like he got punched in the head by um, yeah. Mo Salah or something. And I think that's when he absolutely just completely lost it. You know, when there's just one that just sends you over the, the tipping point. And yeah, there was a lot of time wasting. I um really really good um answers from both of you there and um I'm definitely going to be paying more attention to uh the the club mood um um to club's mood um uh, throughout this um yeah and the Jordan Henderson um hamstring as well which um again is not ideal considering we are looking very very light in the midfield I'm going to go over to Dell now I think he has a question so I'm going to bring him on give me a second. Good evening, how are you doing, right? I'm good, thank you. Good to have you on. A season debut for me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, last week's don't, last, last games don't count because I edited that out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, John, yeah, you, are you good? You say Joe and you Justin? Hi, Dale. Yeah, doing Hi, good, doing good. Yeah, doing good. good, good, good. It was at the 90s. Better than I was at the 90th minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I feel like a fucking idiot because I tweeted out uh, just before uh, we scored the winner. I said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I've conceded the league title now. You can back this Man City, so and so forth. All the Manchester United fans, have, all the, yes, all the Manchester United fans are, are in my mentions, like, ha ha ha, this, that, the other. But I said, mate, it's only reverse psychology. I do that sort of stuff. But uh, what I really wanted to talk about was Jordan Henderson. 
Um, and I heard Joe and he, he Justin uh, kind of like you covering for Henderson's um, your lack of um, your performance. Yeah. And humbly speaking, since start of the season, he was at fault. Yeah, in, in Fulham game, Palace game, and Manchester United game. And today, I'm sorry, he was atrocious. Yeah, for that goal that Isaac scored. How are you letting your guy slip past you like that? Yeah, it's the constant, it's the constant, um, your lack of concentration from him. Yeah, you know, where he's meant to be our captain, our leader, uh, you know, sort of. Yeah, you know, our chief on the field. Yeah. He always was hiding. In every single big game or or any sort of game now, he's always hiding. Yeah. And it's now it's now you're griping on me as in fact that why the hell is Klopp continuously playing him? I'm not playing it Cavalio. Yeah. Every time I've seen yeah, um that that kid play. He's bringing something onto the pitch. He's bringing something extra to the plate. Unlike he is our captain. And it's really pissing me off. And if we do not get a midfielder in that we need, yeah, then I'm sorry, but I'm going to start blaming Klopp now as well because um, all this bullshit of him being too nice and too loyal, yeah, he, yeah, amongst the players. That needs to all be fucked off here yeah, and be more ruthless. Because, you know, ultimately, you know, it's us that's suffering. Your Man City have gone out and bought Harlan. They bought and bought Junior, just Alvarez, and so on and so forth. Yeah, we may not have as much money as them, but as Mo Chatter has said, there's plenty of money to be spent. So why are we being frugal about money? If money's there, go spend it. But, uh, to put it on a light note, uh, I'm glad for uh, the kid, the Cavalio. Um, the two goals in two games, yeah, brilliant start. Him, Harvey Elliott, absolutely amazing today. Absolutely, absolutely. We've kind of touched on that. And, yeah, we've addressed all the Henderson issues as well. Um Del, so thank you so much for calling. Really appreciate it. Um, guys, should we move on to the second half? Because I don't think it could come quick enough uh, for the Reds there. And John, I'm going to come to you. Um, second half started, no changes by Klopp. Um, I felt like, I don't know, maybe Klopp maybe gave him a little bit of a rocket because I do think in the second half we were probably playing better. Yeah, I mean, I felt that our passing picked up, our movement was better, there was more aggression. I thought we used the ball better. I still felt that Mo was on the peripheries. I mean, we haven't really touched on Mo's performance at all. Uh, I think he's... Diaz, I, I noted that it was Diaz that was moving into the centre more and creating threats, that Bobby was beginning to come back deeper. Bobby does some defending. He comes back actually to to help out Trent on one occasion. I was just like, what's Bobby doing there? Winning a tackle. Um, but I felt the second half, yeah, really, we seem to be doing more things right. I felt that we weren't creating enough threats th with Mo. I would like to see him moving into the middle more to mix things up. Uh, you know, Diaz, Diaz is beginning to look like our biggest threat. I found myself thinking, where's the goal coming from? I was looking to get to Diaz for the goal, um, not from Mo Salah, actually, just from the way that we were setting up. And I think that's one of the things that I found hardest to understand with uh, with the setup that Klopp's using at the moment. Why is he Why is he putting Mo out right on the, the, the touchline almost? But yes, certainly things picked up straight after the second half. Better link-up play, better movement. Um, <laughs> whether it was the video analysis that they got in the break or whether it was Klopp telling them to go out and sort it. It must be an immense pressure on him and the players having gone behind yet again. 
Possibly, possibly. And Justin, um, what did you make of the, of the Red Start and um, how they kind of kicked on? Because I, I definitely agree with um, all what John said then. Those are kind of similar notes that I took as well. I thought we were passing better. Um, we just, we couldn't have been worse than, you know, in some of those um, areas where we were quite wasteful. Um, I, di- I was getting very, very concerned about Mo Salah being out so wide. I felt like, you know, there was probably a lot of joy to have against that centre back pairing, and we weren't maybe capitalising it on, you know, on it an awful lot. But obviously, we'll get to Mosala. But he did get to assist. But what did you make of the start? Because I felt like we were moving, we were quicker. It felt like Bobby was being was able to engage with their defence much further up the pitch. Like it seemed as if his need to come drop dropping so deeply. Like basically, you're standing on the toes of the you know the sixes and the eights. Um, it felt like that really stopped, and he act- and he actually started to in- initiate and engage in play in and around their area. I still think we were kind of ropey until actually really really until Bobby's goal. Um, we started creating a bit more corners, and we actually got a shot on target, which was uh, you know a, a key a keystone because you know the 60th minute we started to. Uh, actually look like we had something to throw at their net and the uh, the goal is nice because it is actually kind of a very vintage one two between Mo and Bobby where Bobby just yes. peels off into space and Mo is able to hit him with a cutback that works because of the fact that Mo was actually able to get close to him at that point like yes. it feels like Mo has just been very isolated and the second yes. you can get him closer to another forward he has someone to play with yes. and he Agreed. loves playing with Bobby he like in the situations where Mo gets isolated, he has nobody to play with. It's it's him passing the ball back fifteen yards to Trent or waiting for he Elliot to, him to dribble past like five players and eventually yeah. you're running into a brick wall. It's not gonna yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's or, not gonna happen for him. Yeah, it's just it takes too long to get anybody near him. But he gets closer to the center forward, he can do a lot more of the quicker things that really make our and that to me started to feel like the change uh, in the second half. And yes. uh, I think the one thing that also probably helped, and this is going to not come across well because of how good the player is, it was also getting Trent Alexander-Arnold off the pitch because he was killing it today pretty regularly. Just trying to hit balls that he just couldn't hit. Um, it feels like he's had a few of those games lately. Um, I think he's trying and- to recreate what he did against Bournemouth as well. I think there was a lot of like that kind of aimless kind of shooting from him as well. When, like you said, when you run out of ideas, we're just hoofing it and hoping for the best. Yeah, and it just feels that there were parts of the second half that made us that felt like we were doing things more familiar to what to what we know what to do than in the first half, where it just felt like we were every single player was in acres of space and nobody knew. And yeah, I, th- I think you've absolutely nailed it with um, where Mo Salah's most effective and you know getting close to a forward. And you've you heard both John and I agreeing with you there. John, I'm going to come to you. I mean, what did you make of that goal? I mean, relief. It was great to see Bobby scoring again. I love the fact that that is now three goals and um, uh, three assists for him in the space of two games when he's been on such a drought. I know, quite <laughs> outscoring Mo Salah this season. Who'd have thought it, given how many goals we've scored? No, I, 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 it was a wonderful move. Uh, I think it was, what, you know, 10, 10 or 12 seconds from the second that we got the ball, wham, uh, past. And, and you know, just the link, the link up play was go good. It, it was so good and it looked so effortless. And we didn't have any of this. Let me start again. That to me looked like a Liverpool goal. What we'd been doing up until that point was trying to work the ball out to the sides, whip a ball into the centre of the box, hope that it fall for one of the fast, nimble guys like you know, first to react like Diaz, Mo, whatever, and or or a set piece. And our set pieces have been dreadful. But well, that moment, starting as well, like. Newcastle are quite a tall side and yeah. you're not going to have much joy in whipping the ball from no. the wing. Oh, well, that said, Mo does out jump to, you know, one metre 95 <laughs> defenders right at the death there, which is pretty good for him. But but throughout the match, no, absolutely. So, no, I mean, to go back to Firmino's goal, it felt like a Liverpool goal. Pass, move, quick, incisive passing, incisive running, finding space, effortless finish. 
you know, Bobby hardly, you know, broke a sweat. He's still, he's still got a lot to offer the side. Uh, interestingly, Klopp kept him on, you know, for the full 90. He did, he did, um, which is good and it's, it's good to see because I, I did feel like, um, John, um, once he got that goal, I love seeing um, Bobby in, in, that, in that mood and that vibe. And, you know, I thought, again, after that goal, I felt like, again, the momentum, the, the, the confidence was very much with Liverpool. And, um, and then, obviously, the subs happened. And, again, um, I thought the subs were very, um, I thought I, I kind of liked them. I'm not going to, you know, I thought they made complete sense. Um, you know, Trent coming off. Hendo coming off and, of course, Robbo coming off and um, uh, coming on for those players was Millie, um, who obviously went into um, Trent's position. Then he got Cavalio, who pretty much replaced um, Hendo and uh, Shimmy a uh, straight swap for Robbo. And, um, yeah, um, I thought there was a lot of energy in those moments. And I, I noticed so much about... Um, uh, you were speaking about Roberto Firmino there, John, earlier about him winning a, t- a tackle. I also saw him, I think it was around about 79 minutes, where he was brilliant at kind of stopping... Uh, I think it was a counter um, uh, by, by Newcastle, you know, ran back, tracked back and, you know, um, broke it off. And I, I love that defensive work from him. But again, you know... He was everywhere. Um, I thought we've been speaking about Harvey Elliott, but literally in the second half, I think he just transformed into another beast. He was literally everywhere, wanting the ball, committing himself forward. Was really, really a nightmare for that Newcastle side. Um, but I just saw a lot of um, positive movement from the Reds. But then I felt like the steam started running out again. And I was maybe looking at um, at the end of the barrel of another draw again. That's how I felt. Same here. It really did feel like, you know, it was going down to the wire. We were doing exactly, I couldn't see where a goal was coming uh, unless it was going to be hoofed into the box. Fabinho was trying to shoot it, you know, um, doing his thunder, is, uh, pardon my language, but his thunder bastard strike. He's trying to recreate those. You had Joe Gomez, who really doesn't score. Trying did to- a Navi Keita uh, special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh God, this is awful. Like, you know, it was just bad. Yeah, carry on. No, no, I was just sort of, you know, <laughs> just trying to think through really the way that we were going to win that match. I I was getting increasingly nervous. I mean, it's fantastic. You know, there is no better way to win a match other than 9-0 uh, than right at the death there. It was a fantastic sort of let off. But I would found myself thinking, where is a goal going to come from? Where is it going to come from? Uh, and do, do you want to talk about the goal? Because we're, we're there, so we're in the injury time. And, you know, um, the referee actually adds more minutes on for the time wasting. Um, which is so- fantastic. And as I said, you know, Mo Salah outjumped the defenders to knock it back. And you, you, I mean, this is where I really started on the pod when I sort of said that Cavalier is going to be a really significant player for us. Elliot is technically fantastic. Elliot really impressed me he's a, he's a, he's brilliant he's breathtaking but there is something about Carvalho that that i see for me he's got that he's got that metal and that fight in him that i haven't seen for a long long time i mean i could be wrong he could just go off the rail blah blah, blah. but there is something special in this kid i thought nothing you know when we bought him you know i was like oh yeah yeah who's this kid yeah he'll struggle bro you know i poo-pooed the whole thing now i've seen him a couple of times this guy has something special to to put his body on the line to get that goal to go up it because these are guys are crocs the uh the Newcastle defenders. He he is he is really really an exciting player. It's a brilliant brilliant kick to get it on target. Absolutely. Um, I remember when we were actually being linked with him, and it looked like we probably won't get him. And I did a Media Matters podcast with the um, Fulham correspondent for the Athletic, and the name escapes me now. I do so many of these pods, and uh, you know. It could be like a Coutinho vibe for you and things. And um, yeah, um, I guess you should never ever really compare a player to another player. I think that's wrong. You know, stylistically, let he, you know, Fabio Cavaglio is Fabio Cavaglio. But um, 
I'm really, really interested to see how he um, settles in and uh, where his best position is and where he could be most threatening. I mean, Justin, I'm going to come to you. I mean, just talk to me about that goal and uh, what it meant to you, uh, the, the drama and having, uh, you know, again, that, that theory of yours with um, uh, Mo Salah, having a player close to him where he can actually work with somebody and, you know, cause some devastation. Yeah, um, I think. I mean, I think we got a new only Salah today. Only Mo Salah can uh, have two assists in the match and be and be seen as totally invisible. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's a it's a kitchen sink corner. I mean, I I, I like John basically went completely into uh, pits of despair after Gomez volleyed that ball at yeah. Newcastle's support. But uh, it was really really nice to see at the end a corner where we actually. Um, Showed some fight and kept putting the ball in play. Um, also, just, you know, Mo just being, Mo is a magnet for the ball in the box, which is why I like him there and that's why I love, you know, that's, that's why I still don't get why we're trying to play him so far from it. I get that he's creative, but at the same time, if you're struggling to score goals, sometimes what you don't need is creativity. Sometimes you need brute force. And that's what this goal was. It's Virgil winning a header. The ball just kept getting pushed forward. And Carvalho finding an opportune time where he can actually hit, uh, you know, an absolute two-yard thunder bastard of a volley into into the uh, into the goal. Uh, what did it mean to me? It meant that I haven't had to be talking about a law a, a draw that was totally devastating to me for the last you know seventy minutes. So uh, you know that's that's a big plus. It is a big plus, and I think it would have stung more with all the time wasting, and I think it would have been very, really agitated and irritated. And you know, um, when you've got that game against um, Everton as well, and uh, it, it gives you a lot of confidence because you know, again, one thing that we've kind of known about Everton in these last two games, uh, the Forest game, and of course the game against Leeds, they've been going ahead and they've been conceding goals. So again, that gives you a lot of joy knowing that you know, you know, well, they're not overly great anyway, but the fact that you know we can cause maybe some devastation to them in the latter stages as well. Guys, um, I think we've pretty much come to the end of the pod. Is there anything you kind of want to talk about or just want to get off your chest about this game? I mean, I'm just like, just so thrilled just to see another win. It's great. Um, John, I'll come to you. Anything that you feel that needs highlighting? No, just a final thought, really. Um, I think this win is more important to us than the win against Bournemouth at the weekend. And putting nine goals is fantastic, of course, against a very, very poor side. I mean, that's that's great. But this is this performance shows that even when we're not firing, there is still fire in the belly there of Liverpool Football Club uh, in Jurgen Klopp's fight in the aggression that he, it was good to see in him too. And getting a, a, at the last... Uh, winner there from one of our absolutely young starlets this to me says this is where the season really starts and the rest of the Premier League will look at look up at Liverpool and go "Uh aha they're back they're getting winners right at the end they're not giving up they haven't given up yet I think that's really um you've nailed the you've nailed it there because for me um it's kind of like character defining they had to kind of dig deep within themselves and find the answer and it wasn't easy and you know it required yeah. a lot um i i get that i i know exactly. and and also it's a different way of winning when you know the the chips are against you and you know you you you're a goal down and you you're you're facing that same negative um uh, scenario where you know the outcome hasn't been great for you as a team and you know you have to then dig out the whole you know mentality monster um, attitude and whether they had it and yeah I I I get that that's a good shout and Justin what about you? Um, I I would really just uh, like to see us carry this form you know not this uh, particular form but these uh, this new habit of the la- over the last two games of uh, winning on um, I I really want the process and the form to improve uh, hopefully that does as we get players back. And, you know, we've got now Curtis back in training. We, Diogo apparently starts training tomorrow. Thiago's not far behind. And it's uh, and Darwin is available for selection. So hopefully we've weathered the storm. And hopefully it's, uh, you know, we're able to play uh, how we intended to play rather than what we've been seeing as far as our makeshift start to the season. But, um, you know, 
hopefully hopefully it's good from here and uh, and uh, you know i'll take uh, another you know 32 uh our seasons just started from here wins in a row uh down the rest of the way here here and justin i'll stick with you your man of the match i'll harvey elliott mm-hmm. yeah yeah i th- um i i would have to agree just for his overall performance and you know i i completely agree with you harvey elliott for me was um just brilliant and what about you john who was your man of the match Diaz, um, more goal threats came from what he was doing. Uh, I thought Elliot would be by n- my number two, but Diaz Diaz was more effective around the box, more goal chances. I thought Elliot was a bit more wasteful with uh, ar- around the box, but that's just me being picky. <laughs> They're both fantastic. No, brilliant, brilliant shout. And um, I've got one from NFI here saying Fabinho was his man of the match. Surprised no one said Mosala for just getting two assists and just being absolutely happy with himself that he got two assists. Uh, you know. Nobody, Fabio Carvalho for you know scoring the goal that won us the game. Yeah, you know, um, uh, but yeah, guys, um, thank you so much for tuning in live. A massive thank you to all our callers, Dell, Gags, and Kevin. God, it seems like an agent we spot Kevin. This is how long the pod's been going, and obviously, um, Chris and you never walk alone, foodie, for your questions. Um, a massive thank you to everyone that's listened. Uh, give us um, your feedback. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the game, your man of the match. Before I go, I'm going to just get some plugs from uh, the guests. Uh, again, Justin and John, thank you so much for being on the pod. But where can people find you on on social media? And is there anything you'd like to plug? John, I'll come to you first. Um, if you follow me on Twitter and like my pictures, do come and find me on Vero. Instead of Instagram, I'm sick of Instagram. Come and find me on Vero at John Buskell. You can be the guinea pig. Tell tell us if it's any good and give us your. Oh, I'm loving feedback. it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, he's loving it. He's selling it to us. Okay. Yeah. Do do follow John on on the social medias and his pictures are fantastic. Almost as good as his insight on football. And Justin, where can people find you? And what would you like to plug? You can find me at. Rolls on status. Uh, and what would I like to plug? Uh, I've, got, I've got nothing to plug at the moment. Uh, I guess, but you know what? Listen to the Euro Incision uh, episode that myself, Nina, and Tom James recorded on the Champions League draw. Uh, it's one. still applicable because not a ball has been kicked in that competition yet. Absolutely. And whilst you, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, um, I think you got a bit upset or a bit annoyed at me when you made your Charlie Adams uh, gappy teeth midfield um, analogy and <laughs> you didn't get a response from me um, for my part when I listened back when I listened back I didn't hear it live uh, and when I listened back I was absolutely howling it was so incredibly funny so I understand why you got pissed off at me that was great you nailed it um, yeah do check out the Euro Decision podcast guys um for my part, um, I know John hates Instagram, but I am on Instagram. So give me a follow on at, ne- at the Nina Carver Show. I do like videos and things and, you know, share little um, bits from the pod. Um, I'm keeping it quite interactive and quite uh, busy. So do check that out. And, um, yeah, um, I'll be back again. Post Everton, my God, the season's coming on thick and fast and I'm, I'm super busy and I absolutely love it. But, guys, thank you so much for listening. Take care. Till next time, up the Reds. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.